Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening, I'm Yvonne Stapp and I welcome you to tonight's contemporary science program, Soil, the Skin of the Earth. Our guest is Andrew Kurtz, Associate Professor in the Department of Earth and Environment at Boston University. Dr. Kurtz specializes in the evolution of the Earth's biogeochemical cycles, such as the carbon cycle, and the process of soil development and the effects of weathering and erosion. Andy Kurtz received his PhD in geology from Cornell University in 2000. He joined the Department of Earth Sciences at Boston University in 2001, and in 2007 he joined the Department of Earth and Environment. He's a member of the Geological Society of America, the American Geophysical Union, and the Geochemical Society. We do not hear much about soil, despite its great importance in sustaining life. We are therefore very pleased at the opportunity to learn about the skin of the earth and why we should appreciate it. It is a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Andrew Kurtz. Welcome, sir. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Okay. And as I say, we don't really know, we don't hear very much about soil, and we're very grateful that you're going to fill us in, and you have quite a little show and tell <laughs> tonight can, too, yeah. and so uh, I want to just alert people that we'll be sort of shifting over to, to just that in, okay. in a minute. Um, first of all, could you tell us what soil is, because we just think it's stuff we walk on. Yeah, so soil doesn't get very much uh, respect, right? No. Um, yeah, we call it dirt. We scrape it from underneath our fingernails exactly. and, and so on. But it's really important. So I thought I would actually start by coming up with a definition of soil. And Thank I kind you. of scratched my head and, and tried to think of one. And then I realized that when I teach the intro earth science classes, I have a definition, so I found it. Okay, ah, so here's, great. here's Here what we have. <laughs> this is a definition, and you know, different scientists and different um, uh, people will define it differently. So here's one. Soil is an internally organized natural body of weathered mineral and organic constituents. Okay, so first of all, it has to be internally organized, right? That's, it has a structure that it okay. develops over time. Okay, natural, right? So, you know, a pile of construction debris isn't soil, ah, by this okay. definition at least. Um, weathered mineral, that's something yes. I want to spend a fair amount I of time think, talking yeah, about great. what weathered mineral means, and organic constituents. So basically, we take rock, we add water, we add acids, natural acids that come from plants, we add de decomposed plants, we mix that all up together, give it enough time, and we get soil. Okay. And this apparently, we say, it's called the skin of the earth. Mm -hmm. In what way is it vital to the planet, to the health of the planet? And, and so we, we ask a lot of soils, right? So if you think about it, um, you know, all of our land-based food production uh, depends on soil. Um, soil is, is very, very thin, you know, the, uh, the earth has a radius of 6,000 plus kilometers. The soil is the upper meter or so, so it's a tiny, mm. tiny little uh, fraction. Um, and as I said, our, our land-based food um, uh, production depends on, on that soil. Mm -hmm. um, as the planet becomes more populated over the next century, we're going to need to increase food production from the same soils that we have, and um, so we're going to be asking more and more of them over time. We don't know all that much about natural soils, and it's only been in the last 50 or 100 years that we've really started thinking seriously about conserving the soil resource. That's interesting because we've been destroying it <laughs> that just to that amount of time. time. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So it's yeah. kind of new, the understanding of it. Yeah, I think so. I think a, a lot of the modern notions of soil conservation date back to the 1930s with the Dust Bowl. You know, when farmers moved out to the, the Great Plains and mm -hmm. developed new technologies to plow soil, and what they were doing was, was plowing up soil that had been developing since the end of the last ice age and had developed a really thick, dense layer of organic material on top of it, right? Um, and 
they plowed all that stuff up, basically breaking the, the physical cover, turned it all over, and then they got a couple of lousy years where mm-hmm. it was um, you know, really dry and really windy. And the result was that the topsoil basically blew away. And it wasn't until that soil started landing in places like Washington, D.C. <laughs> that people really start, mm-hmm. started paying attention. And that resulted in um, the development or the establishment of the first federal agencies that were responsible for, um, for conserving soil. So it's really new. It's yeah, really it's, new. It's, and it's meanwhile, really we've continued new. to yeah. kind of be destructive in a lot of ways. It, in terms of the Earth, could we have this planet if we didn't have soil? The planet, have- yeah, the planet would be very different um, if we didn't have soil. I think you know, soil is a is a consequence of the interaction between the biology on the surface of the Earth um, and the rocks that make up the surface of the Earth and um, and water. And so, some soil scientists like to think of soil as sort of a membrane that regulates. Yeah the transfer of energy and matter and water between the atmosphere and the solid earth. So it's this really, really important thin layer uh, that, you know, is really important just naturally in the way the planet works. And it's also really, really important to us uh, through its role in food production. Okay. It's also probably, you know, the most biodiverse uh, uh, ecosystem on the planet because they're just unbelievable and, and poorly understood microbial ecosystems that are present in soil as well. Is that a new area, by the way? I know that you're going to talk about some other aspects, but that understanding of the uh, the ecosystems within soil and how much they vary and yeah, I think, is this yeah, a new area? Right. I think with modern techniques of genomics, we've started to learn a lot more about what organisms are present in soil and what their role is and, and, uh, and so on. Yeah, so that's a, been a really rapidly expanding uh, uh, area of right. soil science. Right, because I think mostly we don't think of soil as alive yeah, in this sense, but it, yeah. re- it really depends yeah. on it. And uh, so in any case, I think you were going to tell us how it evolves. And you've worked in, with soils like in right. many different climates, areas yeah. of, the, of the earth. And I think at this point, to give you maximum time, since you have quite a show and okay. tell there, we'll sort of turn it over and let you explain how it, how soil is made okay. and evolves and so on. Right. Okay, I'm happy to do that. Okay, modern soil science uh, really dates back um, to around the same era that the Soil Conservation Service was set up, and particularly um, at the University of California, Berkeley, there was a soil scientist named Hans Jenny. And, and what Yenny did was he, he argued that the formation of soil was um, governed by five factors, the five factors of soil formation. And those are time, so how much time you have for the soil to develop, biology, what kind of organisms are living in and interacting with the soil, um, topography, right? Uh, topography is, uh, determines whether the soil is accumulating or eroding with time. Um, parent material, that is, what are you starting with to make the soil, and climate. And so you can characterize soil form- forming processes in terms of those um, five soil forming processes. Um, so I wanted to start uh, by illustrating soil forming processes in one particular environment uh, that I've worked on um, a fair bit. Um, this is in, uh, in Puerto Rico, in the Caribbean National Forest. and. Uh, the National Science Foundation uh, that funds a lot of the research that we do there has, has invested a significant uh, chunk of money into understanding the formation of what's referred to as the critical zone. And so the critical zone has become sort of a, a hot new term for basically soil, but including rocks deeper that are involved with soil forming processes and up basically to the top of the forest canopy. So that whole zone is referred to as the critical zone. And a lot of scientists have been uh, investing uh, a lot of energy, time and energy in, in terms of trying to understand how it works. Okay, so in the Caribbean National Forest in Puerto Rico, we start with bedrock. And the bedrock is this kind of material here. This is basically uh, a variety of granite, and this is typical of the rocks that make up the continental crust. And what's going to happen over time is that water is going to uh, interact with this material, and it's going to start breaking down these minerals along the boundaries between the different grains that you can see here. And as they do that, um, 
nutrients are going to be released from those minerals, including phosphorus, potassium, calcium, and plants are going to utilize those nutrients to grow. And so over time, the rock is going to be colonized by plants. Um, as this process continues, um, we're going to start developing a, a soil cover and a, fo and a vibrant forest uh, growing on top of what was once uh, bare rock. And the way that we study soils um, in the field is uh, usually by digging soil pit. So we use the high-tech instrumentation of shovels and knives like this. Um, so this is a, you know, a typical um, soil knife. And what we, what we do is we dig a soil pit and we go down about a meter or so. And typically that's the thickness of soils that you encounter um, in a lot of parts of the world. Some places, including Puerto Rico, can be quite a bit deeper. And then what we do is we crawl down in the soil pit and we start picking apart the soil with our knife and using this um, soil knife to sample uh, soils out of the, the wall of the soil pit. Okay, so this is what we would find basically at the bottom of our pit, rock. And what I want to show you are samples that were collected vertically moving up from the interface between, um, between rock and soil up to the top of the soil. Okay, it's going to be soil that was collected at a depth of 115 centimeters. And when we look at the color and texture of that, you can see that it's sort of got a grayish, slightly reddish cast to it. Um, it's very granular. So what you're looking at here, these grains are really the minerals, the chunks of these minerals that have been liberated from the rock by weathering that's taking place along the, um, the borders of the minerals. And it's got this slightly reddish um, cast to it and that results from um, reaction of the iron that's present in the rock with water. All right, so basically the rock is rusting a little bit and that helps this process along. So we would call this um, the base of the soil or the sea horizon. That's the, basically the bottom of the, of the soil. And as we move up through the soil profile, we're gonna see that the texture and the color and the characteristics of the soil change. Here we are at a depth of about 70 centimeters, so we're approaching the surface. And this soil has a really different color and it's got different mineral constituents in it as well. So it's got a lot more of that rusting of iron has taken place to produce this soil, giving it kind of this much more reddish color. Um, and what's happening in this part of the soil in the B horizon is um, elements are being weathered out of the surface of the soil and then redeposited at depth in this zone. So the B horizon is often referred to as the zone of accumulation. You tend to get really clay soils in the B horizon. Okay, so I wanna move up to the surface next. All right, in our soil profile from Puerto Rico developed on granite. And when we get to the surface, we find something that looks like this, okay? And so this is kind of an A horizon or maybe an OA horizon. So the shallowest profiles in soil going from the bottom, we got rock, C horizon, B horizon, A horizon, and then on the top, O horizon. And O stands for organic rich. Organic rich and then A, B, C, alphabetically with depth. So this is kind of an O, A horizon. And it's got, if you look at this, it's got little fine pieces of roots and stuff in here. And it's much darker in color, kind of brownish than the other soils um, I was showing you. And that's a result of organic matter, the plant material being incorporated into the soil. Okay, so that's what a typical tropical um, soil profile looks like, uh, developed on granite. Uh, in Puerto Rico. This is in a rainforest, so they get a ton of rain, several meters of rain uh, every year. It's a really wet environment. The soils develop really, really fast here. And this is an old, stable um, uh, soil profile. And what I want to do next is I want to contrast that with what soils look like 
that we have in New England, which actually look quite different. So one of the things I wanted to point out about the soil that we were looking at from Puerto Rico is that the, uh, the shallowest soil doesn't really have that much organic matter in it, despite the fact that it's sitting underneath a rainforest that has really lush vegetation. And the reason for that is that when this plant matter, um, the plants die or drop leaves, the plant matter decomposes really, really fast. And that's because there's this enormously active microbial community living in that soil. The soil is very, very warm, and the rate of these microbial reactions consuming, eating that carbon really, really high. So you end up with not a huge standing pool of organic matter in the soil. What I want to show you next is a soil profile from New Hampshire. And this is from the, the Hubbard Brook ecosystem study, which has been uh, going on in New Hampshire for about 60 years now. It's up in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, just at the southern edge of the White Mountains, um, in a typical New England hardwood forest. And it's been the site of a lot of important experiments looking at the effects of acid rain um, and so on, and, and just learning a lot about how our ecosystems work. And comparing this with what we saw from the Puerto Rico soils, several of Yeni's um, factors of soil formation have changed radically here. One, the climate is much different in New Hampshire versus Puerto Rico, obviously. Um, age is different. New England and New Hampshire in particular were covered by an ice sheet up until about 10,000 years ago. So everything that we're looking at that's happened um, in uh, New Hampshire soil formation is relatively young geologically. Um, the parent material is also different, so the rocks that are weathering to produce the soil. So to contrast the parent materials in Puerto Rico, the parent material was this hard, coarse-grained granite. In New England, the parent material is a little bit more complicated as a result of this glaciation. So when the glaciers receded, they left behind a cover of a few meters thick of material that's referred to as glacial till. And what glacial till is, is essentially ground up rock that is deposited at the base of the glacier. When the glacier recedes, till is the cover of the land surface. And then over the last 10,000 years, soil has developed on that cover of till. So I don't know how well we can see this, but it's basically kind of this tannish, grayish, mostly fine grain material that uh, makes up the parent material. And what I want to show is what happens to this stuff as we develop soils over time. So this is a sea horizon soil from a, a, a depth of probably about uh, 80 centimeters a meter um, from Hubbard Brook. And you can see that it looks pretty similar to the parent material. It isn't really that weathered. The, the degree of chemical weathering uh, in New Hampshire is much, much less than it is in Puerto Rico, simply because the time is much shorter and the climate is much less favorable to carrying out these weathering reactions. So let's move up through the soil profile in New Hampshire and see how things change. Okay, so this is gonna be uh, soil that's probably deep A or maybe shallow B horizon soil from uh, New Hampshire. And you can see that, I think one of the first things you notice here is that the color is quite a bit more brown than it is in, um, in the Puerto Rico soil profile. Uh, it's, it's got a lot of uh, chunks of uh, roots and um, bits of leaves and so on in there. Um, and um, what we're going to do now is see what happens when we get closer to the surface. And it's really at the surface where the differences between um, New Hampshire and, and Puerto Rico become really dramatic. Okay, so this is um, a bit of what is referred to as an OA horizon, again, from Hubbard Brook in New Hampshire. Um, you can see it's very, very dark in color. It's got a lot of actually fairly large bits of uh, plant material in it. That dark color comes from the fact that it has a lot of organic matter in it. 
Okay, so this is a really organic rich soil. And so that contrasts a lot with what we see um, in Puerto Rico. We just didn't have this kind of organic rich material um, close to the surface. Again, that's a consequence of mostly differences in climate because there's plenty of, or- of biological activity uh, in both places. Um, but we didn't get the thick accumulation of organic matter in Puerto Rico. And then lastly, in New Hampshire, we get right at the surface what we refer to as an O horizon, a true O horizon. Um, This is basically the forest floor. And so this is organic matter that is just beginning to decompose. Okay, and so you can see all these little bits of roots and, um, and leaves and so on that make a thick cover on the forest floor. And that's really different than what you see, for example, in Puerto Rico, where this material lands on the forest floor, but is really, really quickly decomposed by the um, forest floor microbial community. You mentioned one time when we were talking that the uh, soil is very different, younger in uh, New England, and that uh, it is fragile maybe for some different reasons. Uh, But one of these was climate change. Could you tell us what's happening that has an effect on the soil in that regard? The biggest issue in terms of soils and and climate change is that soils are a really, really large reservoir for carbon. Mm. And so we tend to think of of carbon in the atmosphere and uh, the importance of the amount of carbon in the atmosphere in terms of the greenhouse effect. Right. It turns out that there is about as much carbon in living biomass as there in, is in the atmosphere. Mm-hmm. So changes in the amount of living biomass can influence the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. Furthermore, there's about twice as much carbon as there is in either the atmosphere or biomass as that dark stuff in soil. Mm. Right? The stuff that I was showing you mm-hmm. that was really abundant in the New Hampshire soils and sort of less abundant in the Puerto Rico soils. So it's that plant matter that gets incorporated into the soil that doesn't get eaten up by soil microbes and mm-hmm. turned back into mm-hmm. carbon mm-hmm. dioxide and released to the atmosphere. That's a huge sink for, for uh, carbon in soils. And we think that soils are going to be really sensitive. Soil carbon is going to be really sensitive to changes in climate, to uh, a warming planet. We don't really know how sensitive mm-hmm. or really even in what direction So one of the things that we'd like to know is, as the planet warms, do we expect soils to have more carbon in them? You could imagine that the the planet will be fertilized by CO2, and that will increase plant activity, and maybe that'll result in more carbon in the soils. Or will it result in increased rates of respiration by microbes, Mm. resulting in more carbon being released from the soils mm-hmm. into the atmosphere. Mm-hmm. We kind of don't know. And you don't really we know. We kind of don't know. So when you see said that the snow cover in the winter in would affect this, you, yeah. but you don't know what the result is necessarily going to be. Well, yeah, you should you should talk to my colleague at BU, Pam Templer, who's been working up at, at Hubbard Brook on this very problem. And one of the things that climate models predict is that 50 years from now, 100 years from now, there's going to be much less snow cover mm-hmm. in uh, New Hampshire soils. And you might think that that would result in the soils becoming warmer in the future. But the surprising result is that removing snow cover from soils actually results in the soils becoming colder, okay, because the snow acts as a blanket at the surface of the soil mm-hmm. and basically keeps the soil a little bit warmer mm-hmm. than it would otherwise be through the winter. And what Pam and her students have done is gone up to New Hampshire, up to Hubbard Brook, and actually shoveled out sections of forest floor and instrumented the soils with all kinds of thermometers and so on, and looked at how soil microbial processes and carbon exchange between the atmosphere and soil change as a result of of having colder soils in the wintertime. But they're still in learning mode here, and there's a question, I guess, of how organisms can adapt how exactly. rapidly or not. Right. You also, I believe, mentioned acid rain, mm-hmm. uh, and that this was a big factor. Um, one of the, um, the really interesting uh, uh, scientific issues that um, Hubbard Brook has been critical in addressing is this issue, issue of acid rain. And when 
the founding scientists of, uh, of the Hubbardbrook ecosystem study, Likens and Borman, in the early 1960s, late 1950s, went up and started measuring the chemical composition of the stream water, they found that there was a lot of sulfur and a lot of nitrogen and a lot of calcium, a lot of things that indicated there was acid rain, sulfuric acid, yeah, nitric acid right. being dumped on the soils, and causing calcium, potassium, and so on to be leached out of the soil, delivered into the stream water, and exported from the system entirely. And the question oh. became, does this really matter, right? And it turns out it, it does matter because the calcium, in particular, in soils in, in New Hampshire and, and elsewhere, is a really important nutrient for the mm. forests. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we know in New Hampshire is that some species are really, really sensitive to the, cal the amount of calcium in the soil. And so sugar maples, for example, seem to be really particularly sensitive to calcium. And there's a lot of sugar maples. There's a lot of sugar maples, an important industry uh, in New yeah. England. And if the soils lose calcium, the productivity of the maples declines and you get less maple sugar, uh, maple right. syrup as, as a consequence. And so one of the things that has been studied really intensely in New Hampshire is how soils hold on to or release calcium when subject to acid rain. Uh, I'm really surprised that that's such a huge factor, that, mm -hmm. that, that uh, you there are all kinds of fallout from acid rain, but uh, this is a new one that yeah, it so has it essentially, it really yeah, affects. Essentially, what's, what's happening is that you burn coal in coal-burning power right. plants, particularly in Ohio, where I come from, so it's my fault with this, this uh, happened, I needed to turn you. the television we, uh, on in the 70s. We need a scapegoat. And, <laughs> right. And, and so the, the coal has sulfur in it, and mm -hmm. when the sulfur combusts at high temperature, when you burn the coal, it produces sulfuric acid. And those little sulfuric acid droplets can survive in the atmosphere for a yeah. couple of days before they fall out. And that's just enough time to move a cloud from the Ohio Valley to New England. And so um, the, the pH or the acidity mm -hmm. of, of, um, of rainfall in New England, particularly in the 1950s and 60s, was really quite low, much lower than it, it ought to be. And that's the, 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 the reason for the name acid rain. And what seems to happen is that when that rain that contains uh, these acids in it interacts with soil, the acid in the water replaces the calcium that's sitting on the surface of the soils and exchanges the calcium and sends it into the stream water. Mm. So without getting too deep into the, the chemistry of how soils work, um, soil particles are electrically charged. Right. And right. they're usually, they have a slight negative charge on them, so they attract positively charged ions like calcium, calcium. Right? right? And if we take hydrogen ions, which are in, in acid, and flood the soil with hydrogen ions, it replaces the calcium. Calcium gets Just kicked like off that. and goes into stream. And then the calcium's gone. And the calcium is only going to be replaced by chemical weathering of that till in the bedrock from below. And, and that, that takes a long happen time. Overnight, yeah, does that it? takes a long time. Right. Right. So right. once you lose that that fertility, it's really hard to get it back. So they discovered this sort of by the by after mm -hmm. what they realized what the acid rain was doing, but then right. to understand its relationship to forests, which I don't know, we sort of didn't think along those lines in the in the in the general uh, public or something. Yeah, I think didn't that know was, that. Yeah, that's been one of the the big concerns about about acid rain. Um, is that it really negatively impacts the health of forest ecosystems. Yeah, right. And that led to, in the early 1970s, um, a series <coughs> of Clean Air Acts that regulated the amount of acid that could be emitted by coal-burning power plants. Right. So this is actually uh, an example of an environmental problem that can be addressed. Mm -hmm. You can put scrubbers on power plants. The scrubbers remove the acid from the, um, the exhaust stream before it's released to the atmosphere. And the forests still have some long-term effects from the acidity, but the amount of acid being dumped on, on forest ecosystems, in, in New England at least, is much, much less uh, yeah, that has been reduced then appreciably. Yeah. I was just going to say that I was aware, I, th I think, that from the Ohio Valley and so, so forth, these smokestacks also have sent the 
pollution to Canada, for mm -hmm. instance, so that uh, lakes and rivers yeah. and things were, and, and in addition to forests. Yeah, I tend to be kind of New England affected. centric, but yeah, yes. Canada has received right, a, lot, exactly. a lot of Right, exactly, and they were pretty upset well. about it. I can but it, uh, what I st what I meant to say was, you have to have a sort of global policy mm -hmm. there. Everybody's got to be on the. Well, so that's the, the kind of the interesting thing, uh, interesting thing about acid rain, and I think the reason that it's actually a solvable environmental mm -hmm. problem is that it's really kind of a regional problem. I mean, the region mm -hmm. is fairly large, mm -hmm. but it's a regional problem. Like the acid rain that's produced in, in uh, the Midwest of the United States isn't going to affect Europe. It isn't going to affect China. They have their own sources of acid rain. They can clean those up or not, and some places have done a better job than others in, in that. Of course, the other thing that's released from um, from uh, coal burning power plants is carbon dioxide, mm, which is mm -hmm. not at all regulated. It's not touched by the Clean Air Act, and is a global problem because the time scale at which carbon stays into the atmosphere is much longer mm -hmm. than the time scale at which mm -hmm. these um, the acidity stays in the atmosphere. So it basically the the CO two that we emit from Ohio Valley coals. The CO2 that is emitted from coal stacks in China, all of that stuff mm -hmm. mixes together and mm -hmm. becomes everybody's problem. And that's one of the things that makes that such a tricky problem to solve. And the soil can't be an endless sink for this, the soil just like the yeah, ocean the soil can't, can't be, be an, an endless, endless sink. sink. Yeah, and we've been, you know, the scientific community has been trying to come up with a lot of different ways to, mm -hmm. to store uh, carbon in soils, to store carbon in rocks, to store carbon at the bottom of the ocean, but it's a it's a tough problem, and it's expensive, right? and it requires a lot more research. And in the figure. end, you'll still have to stop pumping it into the atmosphere, yeah, right? Exactly. But that's, that's very interesting that the scientific community is sort of learning on the move mm -hmm. as well, that a lot of this is kind of new, yeah. really, and that the, I guess this will be a global enterprise down the line. In terms of your own research, do you see this as like a lot of international cooperation scientifically in terms of dealing with this or understanding the situation of the soils? Yeah, sure. I think there's a, there's a really active um, international community that's, that's um, devoted to trying to understand these, what I referred to earlier as critical zone processes. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the, the critical zone is this term that this community has coined to try to draw attention to the fact that soils are really important. So there's a network of these critical zone observatories in the United States. Uh -huh. um, one of them is in Puerto Rico, um, the site that I was talking about earlier. And there's also a network of, uh, of critical zone sites in Europe. And there's been a lot, recently, a lot of international cooperation in trying to merge all of these different sites into a big network. So we can use, we can basically create a matrix yeah. where we have soils in, in critical zone ecosystems developing in tropical climates, in cold climates, on granite, on glacial till, on volcanic rocks, and try to understand how all of these factors interplay and control the ability of soils to hold carbon, to sustain uh, you know, diverse ecosystems, et cetera. So the scientific community, the global scientific community is sort of really on the task here. Absolutely. And of course, I guess you have pretty sophisticated ways of gathering data and sharing data, and that's a, a mm -hmm. kind of a recent thing too. What can the public do to learn more or to support scientific work? Or is, what should we be aware of? Because I, we do not get a lot of media for yeah. soil. So I think one of the <clears throat> one of the really positive things that a lot of my colleagues have done is write books that can help educate the general public on some of these important issues. So are I brought you, another yes. prop. I was going to say, are you going to write one? I, I, <laughs> I'm going to leave one. it to you. Um, so this is this is a book that uh, I wanted to plug here and. Um, Dave Montgomery, if you ever see this, you can uh, thank yes. me later. Um, Dave is a, a geomorphologist at the University of Washington, and he's written a series of books um, that take some of the things that we've learned uh, in science and try to make them available to the general public. So this book is called Dirt. And basically what um, Montgomery's argument is that degradation and erosion of soils is a huge problem and it's an accelerating problem and if we look in the geologic record and the archaeological record we can see evidence that past civilizations have been really neg negatively impacted 
by the failure to to manage their soils. Right, they collapse. Yeah, they collapse. <laughs> so it's 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 one of the factors, maybe an important one, that, that mm-hmm. leads civilizations to collapse. We now have the ability to, we know more about soil now than we ever have before. We know a fair bit about managing soils. And if we put that that information into action, then, then we can we can make a positive impact. In that case then, can is it restorable if that is, if we act now? Yeah, I and mean, we can restore the quality of soils. Mm-hmm. So soils that have lost a lot of organic matter can have organic matter added back to them and we can make them more more fertile uh, that way. Once the soil has been eroded, mm-hmm. um, it's a trickier problem, right? Because we're, we're starting with a fairly thin layer of soil in most places. Yeah. If the soil isn't well managed, wind, such as in the Dust Bowl, rainfall, right. gullying, and so on, can take that soil and move it into streams. And it becomes kind of a double-edged sword there because now not only have you negatively impacted the soil itself, removing it, but you've also negatively impacted your aquatic ecosystems Mm -hmm. because one of the major pollutants of stream waters and lakes and so on is sediment, and the sediment is eroded soil. So it's really important to try to address erosion before it gets out of hand. You can, indeed, like the situation in New England, if they get a grip will the soil right. recover? One, yeah, so one of the, the experiments that's been done up at Hubbard Brook that I think is, is really interesting is, is um, trying to look at what the impact of um, forest management uh, on soils is. So, for example, in New England, a common uh, forest management approach in the past and to a certain extent in the present is clear cutting. Right? So you take yeah. a swath of forest, you cut everything down, you wait for the trees to grow back up, and the idea is you're going to cut them all down again, right? Virtually all the forests in New England were, were yeah. cut down at some point in the past. The forest at Hubbard Brook looks like a big, mature forest. It's really only about 90 years old. Mm. It was all clear-cut prior to that. And so one of the things that scientists have done up there is to do these large-scale manipulation experiments, such as cutting down all the trees and looking at how that impacts the chemistry of the stream water mm. and looking at what it does to the soils themselves. And what we find, one of the projects that I've been involved with up there, is when you cut down all the trees, you get this huge flushing of calcium out of the soil, right? Shows up in the stream water, gets exported into Hubbard Brook, into the Merrimack River, and then into the Atlantic Ocean, so it's gone. And one of the questions is, how many times can we expect to grow up a forest, cut it down, have flush all this calcium out, and, and still be able to have productive soils. And I don't know that we, we know the answer to exactly how many times But it's that something is. to get a heads up yeah, about something, something because that clear on. cutting, I think, is happening in the Amazon. It's right. happening in uh, Central Africa right. and regions, these uh, ancient forests and right. stuff. So right. that's right. another thing. What's right. interesting from what you say is the scientists are still learning a oh, lot, yeah, we're still right? Actively, so young yeah, science, and I hope stuff. a lot of young people will say, good, let's get involved in this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I hope that the public will be, you know, take a, take notice yeah. of this too, that this soil is something we should take care of yep. and stuff. Dr. Kurtz, thank you very oh, much for all pleasure. this great yeah. information. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome.